I first want to thank the other collaborators, the other um, key members of the team, especially Luke Smiley uh, and Stefan Bodo Yoshikishima, and two excellent student researchers who have been part of this, Kun Zhao and Erin Lorne. <coughs> so, what we aimed to do uh, in this project was first to think a little bit more about a construct we're calling enlightened compassion, which I will explain a little bit more in a few slides time, um, to demonstrate the coherence of this construct and its utility, um, demonstrate its construct validity more broadly, uh, and examine the relationship between this construct and a range of morally relevant uh, constructs, especially moral creativity. So our approach towards moral exceptionality was via moral creativity. I'll outline our thinking on that in a moment. Um, and finally, we attempted to explore uh, physiological and neural correlates of enlightened compassion. Uh, this is ongoing, so I won't say too much about that. I'll tell you a little bit about the design of this study and how, how it's set up. It's running as we speak. Um, but that's, that's the overview of the project. What I'll talk about, oh, also, oh, I about that. Uh, and to develop a targeted measure of enlightened compassion. So um, we, as a supplementary aim, uh, developed a targeted measure of this construct uh, to go alongside some, some uh, measures that we pulled out of extant um, uh, questionnaires uh, in the literature already. That also is ongoing, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what that looks like. Um, but I'll focus on the first two points. So what I'll talk about is um, enlightened compassion as a kind of moral exceptionality first, so just let you know how we're thinking about uh, moral exceptionality and how enlightened compassion relates to that. Um, then I'll take you through some conceptual definitions and some operational definitions, how we measured this. Um, I'll step you through a few studies looking at construct validity, so how this, this uh, construct is related to a range of other constructs. Um, and finally, talk a little bit more specifically about how enlightened compassion can contribute to the expansion of moral concern, especially across um, human, non-human animal boundaries and, and potentially beyond, and also its contributions to moral creativity. So I've got presented you, but this is so, it's so small, your computer is so small. <laughs> I can't actually read what's coming up next, so. <laughs> no, anyway. Um, so it's going to be a surprise for me as we go through as well. So we start our entry to, um, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Um, squint. Approach moral exceptionality, the way we're thinking about it through reasonably commonplace observation that yeah, the world faces a variety of pressing moral and social problems, including complex things like climate change, how to resolve their multiple, you know, problematic, intractable, intergroup and value conflicts around the world, um, questions about how to deal with, with migration and all the rest of it. And these kinds of issues, although they have um, many unique features, uh, on our view, they seem to share a set of common features. Um, many of them involve multiple stakeholders from people who have an interest in what's going on and how these problems are resolved. They typically involve some kind of trade-off or conflict between values or interests, often sacred or sacralized values or interests. These values can often be correlated with or intrinsic to the stakeholder identities that are at play in the, in the, um, in the situation. Uh, and there's often a need for collective action, getting different kinds of people to work together to resolve these dilemmas. And because of these features, these problems are complex, they're difficult to resolve, and simple rules, moral rules, um, deontological rules, or simple um, utilitarian cost-benefit type calculations typically won't do to solve them. Um, and because of this, because they are pressing and because they are difficult, um, we argue that any progress at all towards modus vivendi, pragmatic, workable solutions to these kinds of problems can be seen as a kind of uh, moral exceptionality. Now, whether you agree with that or not, I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but that's, that was our approach, right? So our idea of moral exceptionality is tied up with a particular kind of problem solving, resolving these sorts of, of issues. And we suggest that because such problems are complex and simple rules won't do, do usually, um, workable solutions, the kind we're after, uh, are likely to require moral creativity, right? moral imagination, moral creativity. Now, this construct hasn't been 
very much explored uh, empirically in the psychology literature. There are some who have, who have written a little bit about it. Uh, one definition comes from, from Hastie, 1993, talks about um, moral creativity as involving vision, which is the capacity to discover and define moral problems, also uh, feelings of efficacy, um, feeling that you can do something about them, and responsibility, feeling that to some extent you are responsible for what's going on and what, what is to be done. That, most of that doesn't sound like creativity to me, or moral creativity really. Um, a definition closer to what we're using comes from Caldwell and Moberg in 2007. One of the very, very few empirical psychology studies on this, um, they talk about moral creativity as being, um, as involving unconventional solutions to moral problems, uh, so original unconventional solutions. Uh, morally creative solutions also display some kind of reference to moral or ethical concepts or language. They also display some kind of uh, evidence of perspective taking or, or empathising. And that, when you combine them, is what these guys think of as moral creativity. And we're working with something quite close to this. Um, when we look at moral creativity later on and we, we code for it and measure it, we are focusing on the tendency to, to deliver original or unconventional solutions to moral problems. We started by including these, these ideas of the ethical content and perspective taking as being intrinsic to our definition. We had some problems, just to foreshadow a bit, um, coding these elements in our solutions. And so we ended up just focusing on originality and, and unconventionality as, as, the, as the key, um, which I think retains the idea of creativity, maybe loses a little bit of the moral content, but we can talk about that later. Um, and our claim is that because of these sorts of properties, especially because these kinds of solutions, in virtue of them involving perspective taking, reflection on diversity of values, these are more likely to be workable solutions in those kinds of problems where there are multiple stakeholders. Um, and because they're workable, um, we argue that morally creative solutions then are morally exceptional solutions. That's, that's how we, we get to moral creativity as a kind of a moral exceptionality. Now, <clears throat> The key question for us in this grant was who is likely to be morally creative and that's morally exceptional. And the short answer is those with enlightened compassion. Um, we define this construct first of all in the context of, of the Big Five, and you guys by now know about this. Big Five dimensions of personality. This is usually the way it's talked about at the domain level in the hierarchy where you've got neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, extroversion and openness. What's particularly relevant to us is some recent work, recent ish work by Colin DeYoung, who elaborated what's called the aspect level of this hierarchy. And what he did was he took each of the five domains and split them into two aspects, um, which is interesting, I think, and important because when you look at the predictive utility of these aspects, they predict different things, right? So even, even though within, for example, agreeableness, you've got compassion and politeness, uh, and they're correlated with each other, they do predict different things, and they're worth separating. So, Despite them predicting different things within domains, you also find interesting um, and replicable correlations between them, which you would expect based on this hierarchical structure. Now, that's not that's not particularly useful for our talk, but what what uh, for, for our project? But what we discovered, and our first sort of insight into this idea of enlightened compassion, was that um, two aspects that sit in different domains were consistently showing correlations in this range, right? Despite sitting in different domains. So what this suggested to us is that there may be some kind of um, meta trait sitting kind of at this level, maybe in between somewhere, that was a combination of openness and compassion. We saw that in our pilot data. If you look at de Young's original work, you see the same correlation. So you're getting these correlations between aspects that, that in the hierarchical model probably shouldn't be correlated that highly, but you're getting it over and over again. And the question to us was, well, what, is, what does it actually mean? So that was, that was our first inkling that there might be something in the combination of open, openness and compassion that would be interesting to explore. And it's this that we're calling um, enlightened compassion, at least that's the starting point for it. So in the context of the Big Five, we view enlightened compassion as a, as a, a cross domain, there should be a space between A and cross, is a cross domain trait capturing the intersection <laughs> of openness and compassion. Compassion, as defined by de Young um, and reflected in the items that measure it, uh, captures emotional attachment to and concern for others. It's been associated with pro-sociality um, and empathy. Openness, uh, you can describe it in, 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 a few, in a few ways, but 
central to it seems to be the ability to detect spatial and temporal correlational patterns in sensory and perceptual information. Because of that, it's related to things like creativity in general, to aesthetic sensitivity, to richness of emotional experience and a range of things like that. Um, you would probably expect compassion to be related to morality, broadly speaking, which, which it is. Openness has not really been explored very much at all in the moral domain. And one of the things that we're seeing over and over again, not just in this project, but in other work we're doing, is that openness is doing something for morality that people haven't really appreciated up until now, which is a really interesting, I think, independent um, thing to, to, dis to discover along the way. Now, because uh, of the uh, association between these two, we're suggesting that there's a sort of an overlap, in you know, a sort of Venn diagram style um, overlap, and we suggest the overlap is enlightened compassion, it comprises capacities and motivations to extend concern and care to others, that's the compassion component, potentially to do so flexibly and in unconventional ways, potentially involving flexible uh, application of uh, concern across group boundaries. That's the conjunction of openness and compassion. And potentially also, given the relation to, uh, between openness and creativity, the capacity to envision multiple and often novel courses of morally relevant action in problem solving. So you put openness with compassion, you get, you get these things. And I think this is how we start to think about it. And because of this, we thought, well, it's probably going to be related to, to moral creativity. And that's, so that's how we sort of made that initial connection between this um, sort of bottom-up empirically sort of discovered construct and our, our view of, um, in, uh, of moral exceptionality as moral creativity. And it's the intersection, we argue, that matters for moral exceptionality and moral creativity because openness alone is creative but morally mute. It's not clear what moral connotations just being creative has. I mean, there, there is some work in social science that says, shows that creative people can, in some circumstances, be more dishonest. They use their, their creativity for for um, bad ends, uh, and compassion alone um, is uh, pro-social, so moral in some sense, but parochial. And there's a big debate around um, the extent to which Paul Bloom is at the heart of it, around the extent of empathy and how far you can actually extend it um, as a basis for moral progress. So it's the intersection, the combination that matters, I think, for our version of moral exceptionality. So what we did, we initially planned um, three separate studies. Um, two really big ones, uh, and then a follow-up one. Um, and instead what we did was run eight studies, um, which really took the first two big ones and just split them up into sub-studies that answer similar questions. But it allowed us to sort of more incrementally explore different kinds of questions. So these are the studies we, we have run. The eighth study is currently running. This is the, the lab study I'll talk about in a second. Um, we sample reasonably large samples, different um, uh, populations, in all these studies, we have a, a lot of measures. We always have the, <coughs> the BFAS to allow us to estimate the line compassion in that context. We have items to develop our, our, our novel measure. We have a range of morally relevant and less morally relevant uh, items as well. I'll talk about some of these as we, as we go through. I'm going to focus on the studies highlighted in grey. Um, these two and then this one, or these three and then that one, uh, just because that's where I think most of the interesting stuff is, that's where most of the analyses have been, have been done. But there's, there's mountains of data um, and we are still wading through it. So what I'm going to focus on is questions around replicating the coherence of the light and compassion as a unitary construct and doing it with different operational definitions, so different ways of measuring it, embedding in light and compassion in the nomological network, so initial questions around construct validity, and then talking explicitly about it in relation to moral expansion and moral creativity. As I said, there's a lab study um, which, is, is, which is running now. Uh, it took us a bit longer to get set up. We had to develop two novel tasks for this, which I think are quite interesting. Uh, I'm happy to talk about them in, in questions if, if, you, if you like, uh, but I'll, 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 move, I'll move along. Um, so how are we operationalizing or measuring enlightened compassion? So we're doing it in a range of ways. So first of all, we're utilising the Big Five Aspects Scale, which is Colin DeYoung's measure of his aspects. Each of, the, each of the aspects is measured with ten items, and there are a variety of ways you can put these together to get a composite. You can either average across the 20 items measuring openness and compassion, you can create composites of the openness items and the uh, compassion items and average those composites, or you can subject it to a factor analysis, extract a common factor, um, and proceed that way with factor scores. Um, we've done it all ways. There's, there's lots of overlap in the results. There are some differences, and I think we can understand why there are differences, and I can get to those in the, in the questions if, if you like. I'm going to focus on, on factor scores as the way of operationalizing in, in, this, in this talk. Um, very briefly, we are um, still undertaking enlightened compassion scale development 
um, process. We have done item development and initial refi refinement from 72 items down to 24. That interim 24 item scale has good psychometric properties, but it's just too long. We want it to be more efficient than that. We want to try and get it un under 10, because otherwise you might as well just use the 20 items from, from, from the VFAS. So we want to make it really efficient. Um, and we're in the process of doing that. We're currently doing a panel study where we can, we can get a, a test, retest, reliability, and predictability. Um, so that's an ongoing process. And that is really being driven by Aaron Lawn, who's an excellent PhD student. So let me get to some data. Um, so this data that I'll talk about over the next few slides comes from three studies, a total of about 1,400 participants drawn from MTurk and undergraduate Australian samples. Um, for the purposes of this talk and to keep the, 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 the numbers um, to a minimum, I've just put them together, aggregated across them, and, and, and reported summary correlations and, and analyses by and large. Um, but it's not, that won't be our final analysis, but it's useful enough for these purposes. Correlations um, between openness and compassion across the three studies, one, two, and three, are good. They're the same as we've got in our pilot data, they're the same as DeYoung gets. They're still in, they're in the range of the within domain correlation. So replicate that, those associations. If you put the 20 items from the openness and compassion scales into an exploratory factor analysis, pull that one factor, it works, you get one factor, all the items load on it, that accounts for between um, uh, a fifth and a quarter of the variance in that, in that item pool. So this does look, at least by those measurement standards, like a reasonably coherent um, construct. The reliability is always above um, 0.7, so it looks, looks reasonable from that point of view. Now, some initial um, convergent validity as I said, we measured lots and lots of things in these studies, but uh, these I think some of the most interesting. Um, so if you take the enlightened compassion um, factor score as your central variable, these are zero order correlations with a range of morally relevant uh, correlates. First of all, enlightened compassion is associated with um, gender, so females tend to be higher than males, perhaps not unsurprisingly. Political liberals tend to be higher than conservatives, perhaps not unsurprisingly. It's not associated with religiosity at all, or religious identification at all in any sample. It's not associated with age either. So there's some demographics. If you start with honesty, humility, this is a trait from Hexaco, which gets at the, the tendency um, for people to want to avoid manipulating others, um, feeling a little temptation to break rules and so on. You find an appropriate correlation there. Negative correlation with the dark triad, which is a composite of narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychoticism. Positive association with costly prosociality, such as an aggregate of things like volunteering, organ donation, blood donation, etc., etc. Positive correlation with moral imagination, which is a self-reported tendency to engage in um, reflection um, and questioning when one when one resolves moral uh, dilemmas in their life. Interesting positive association with, with intellectual humility, which is a which is a nice trait, which gets at the extent to which you think your opinion is just one among many. So you have to accept that you are wrong in certain circumstances. Associated with um, two of the Schwartz values uh, in sensible ways, self-direction and universalism, and it's associated with a moral expansiveness scale, which I'll elaborate a little bit more in a few slides time. So this looks quite reasonable, um, decent correlations, what we would expect. There are also a, ra there are also a range of uh, correlations um, in our data sets that get a divergent, a discriminant validity, which is quite nice, so it's not correlated with things you wouldn't expect it to be, and so on. So this all looks good for the moment. Now, this is all fine, um, what we expect, but the next question becomes, what does this give us as a combined construct over and above what you, uh, openness does on its own, or what compassion does on its own? That's a key question. I think it, it, the short answer is it gives us something. So if you just focus on um, the uh, correlation I talked about, that's reproduced over there on the bottom left, what you find is when you take out compassion and just look at openness alone contributes to these variables, you really see a decrease in almost everything except the two that remain in green up there. So it's a bit of a suppression effect for self-direction, which makes sense in intellectual humility. So they're really being driven primarily by openness alone. Everything else suffers a drop. The black arrows show a, sort of a, a, a decrease in, in degree. Um, and these more uh, pro-social um, related traits at the bottom drop out completely. So openness alone doesn't get us what the land compassion does. Neither does compassion in a different, in a different way. So self-direction, intellectual humility drop out. The black arrows drop uh, in degree. Um, the pro-social ones are retained. 
but it seems here that compassion is contributing to, to pro-sociality at the bottom, but less to the more uh, creative, expansive, universalizing qualities that openness seems to be essentially involved in. So that, this to us seems to make sense. So broadly speaking, enlightened compassion is the composite trait predicts more strongly and more broadly than do, does either of these alone. So it gives us something in that regard. Now, the next slide I'm gonna skip because this is just for moral foundations enthusiasts, um, uh, which I don't know if they're in here in, in, anymore, but uh, I'll skip that. Um, I wanna unpack two measures in, in ways I think are really interesting and, and, and go further to the idea that line compassion gives us something that compassion and openness alone do not. Moral expansiveness scale, um, was developed by uh, a colleague of mine, essentially asks people to rate the extent to which they feel morally obligated to show concern for a range of entities, moral patients, along the, the x-axis here. And these, these sort of radiate out from you, in-group, out-group, and across boundaries, out towards you, the environment as a whole. The scale is not ideal. Dangerous people mess it up. Um, I don't think that, that, that really should be in there. They're, they're a different kind of moral patient in this case. But in any case, what you see on the y-axis, I observed zero order correlations between the enlightenment compassion factor score and moral concern for these patients. The green is enlightened compassion. And you see, with the exception of this, um, reasonable and significant correlations between line compassion and, and moral concern for all these entities. Now, really interestingly, if you take compassion alone, which is blue, or openness alone, which is orange, you see this divergence. So compassion only predicts moral concern for things close to you. It's on the left side there, so that's the blue, bar, uh, blue line up there. It, over here, it doesn't do anything. Right? Openness doesn't do anything when it comes to predicting moral concern for people and things close to you. But as soon as you get beyond the um, human animal boundary, it's openness doing, doing the work. <coughs> Put them together and you get enlightened compassion sustaining that moral concern across, across the, the, the board. You get a similar pattern when you think about same ideas in the context of the Schwartz value scale. So benevolence <coughs> is really about um, care for the enhancement of the welfare of people um, who you're in frequent personal contact with, so people like close to you, whereas universalism and its various components gets at a more general concern for the welfare of all, tolerance for all, and uh, concern for nature. And you see the same pattern. Enlightened compassion predicts um, valuing these things across the board, but you get this beautiful crossover. Uh, I couldn't believe it the first time I saw it. Beautiful crossover um, with compassion sort of just not doing much at all when you get out towards nature, but openness to doing it all. So I think that together suggests uh, that enlightened compassion, at least as it's measured using BFAS, is coherent, um, it's, a, it's efficient, and it takes 20 items and gets it down to one dimension. Um, it's to some extent, as we've explored so far, construct valid and morally relevant. Um, and I think it provides insight not offered by um, the unique effects of openness and compassion, especially when it comes to sort of non-parochial extension of moral, of moral concern. So that's the initial work. I want to turn now to moral creativity, um, which is where we started. Um, we've discovered a lot about this, this construct along the way, but moral creativity is where we started. And I just want to tell you about a final study um, where, we, where we explored uh, this in full detail. So in all the studies we measured we gave people moral problems to solve. There were different kinds, and um, I'm only going to present one study here. Uh, the coding for this stuff is an absolute killer, um, and so we've, we've still got lots of, lots of data that still needs to be fully coded. This is the one study where we've done the, the, the full coding, um, and it almost, it almost killed my students. So uh, th thanks again to them. Um, so what, we, what we're expecting is that enlightened compassion, those high enlightened compassion, in the context of moral problem solving, will be better at generating sets of creative possible solutions, um, and also from those generated sets, be better able to select good or better or correct ultimate solutions from the set. So we're suggesting that line compassion will influence um, solution generation and solution selection. So you can think about the moral problem solving process as one where you're presented with a, with a, with a problem. Um, you first need to see that it's a problem. We, we sort of did that work for our participants. But once you've done that, you then sort of generate or explore the possible solution space, which is a divergent thinking process where you're sort of opening up and continuing multiple alternatives. We ask them then to think about 
or choose which, which solution they think is best from what they've selected and then elaborate that. So we've got these two stages and we've coded aspects of both of those stages, divergent and sort of con convergent. So we think enlightened compassion will play through in this way, contributing to generation and selection of um, solutions, uh, creative solutions. And given what we sort of discovered along the way and what we know from previous literature, we we're also kind of expecting openness to really play a role in a divergent process here, the generation stage, where you're just sort of opening up and being creative. So, thanks. And compassion to play a role in the sort of convergent or solution selection phase. phase. Because they're moral problems, because the ones that the items we used involved actually sort of really trying to um, make sure everyone was kind of happy and satisfied, we thought that the capacity to perspective take would really be useful in selecting which of the solutions generated would actually be, be best here, right? would be mutually acceptable to everybody involved. So that, that's, that's our thinking, and um, it was borne out. So this study, 251 participants, we had a range of measures in this. Um, the BFAST, our uh, interim 24 item enlightened compassion scale, etc. We gave people um, a elaborate scenario, an affirmative action scenario, which was race related and in, in the workplace. The short story was um, you, you have to imagine that you are a, a recruiter, you're faced with a decision between two candidates, a, um, an Anglo, um, highly qualified candidate, a less qualified minority group candidate, and um, your, your company uh, has an affirmative action policy broadly in place. How best to go about this? What do you do here? Do you just hire one or the other? Do you, what, do you, what do you do? How do you, how do you um, resolve this? And so we asked them to, first of all, um, generate a list of possible solutions and then select from this list their preferred solution to justify it in, and, and sort of um, contemplate it more in a, in a longer format response. These were all coded, the list solutions and essay solutions, uh, in terms of moral creativity um, on fluency, how many solutions were generated in the list stage, flexibility, the number of unique categories into which the list solutions fell, originality, so this is um, how it's, a, it's an intuitive um, assessment of how original, unconventional the solutions are. We average this across all, all, the, all the solutions uh, per person, so again, average originality score for their list solutions. A quality composite, so we had our raters rate how mutually acceptable right, do you think the solution would be to all stakeholders involved in the thing? Um, and how feasible is it? We put those together and again, averaged across the individual list solutions per person. Um, and then what we did to, to really get at whether these solutions are good and mutually acceptable is we had a separate um, sample of, of MTurkers who belonged to the, to the stakeholder groups, the minority or, or majority groups, rate the selected solutions for how acceptable they personally found them. <clears throat> so um, these are all going to be correlated in virtue of, sort of just the same person doing the rating, same people doing the rating. But this, this down here is a, set, is a separate thing, separate set of people. And uh, that's fine, the details don't really matter, seeing as I probably have two minutes left. Um, what did we find? So this is just a reasonably straightforward um, path model showing the role of enlightened compassion in the different stages of the moral problem solving process. So we find that enlightened compassion makes a contribution to the average originality of the list solution. So people who are high in enlightened compassion come up with more original solutions on average when they're asked to sort of explore that space. List originality predicts list quality. So the more original your, your, your list solutions are, the, um, the more acceptable they are, the more feasible they are. Right? This is just for the list solution stage. Enlightened compassion has nothing to do with flexibility. That's a number of different categories you draw on, or fluency. And fluency and flexibility have quite little to do with, with solution quality. If you expand this to include ratings in the selection stage, so this is the acceptability as rated by stakeholders, right? what you find is that the same model holds through and you get average quality of the list solutions translating into uh, better accepted selected solutions. Right? So people who are high in enlightened compassion generate more original solutions in their exploration of the problem space. They are better quality solutions, which means that they're more likely to select a solution that is accepted by stakeholders in the, in, the, um, in the context. The indirect effect is small, but it's significant. Um, that's fine, thanks. Uh, and that is a nice story. And openness does its work in the first part of the model, contributing to flexibility and originality. Compassion does its work in 
contributing to this, this latter part, which is kind of what we said. Their marginal effects, um, not significant here. Uh, and again, this kind of suggests that from just a sort of simplicity point of view, enlightened compassion gives us something more than, than these uh, on their own. So that's, um, if I can just summarize, um, I think what, we, what we've shown so far is that enlightened compassion is coherent and efficient. It's construct, construct valid across a range of operational definitions. Um, I think it's particularly useful to sort of explore this in the context of, of the BFAS because there are lots of studies already out there that have used this measure. And if this is reliable, you can just revisit all that data, put these openness and compassion together and, and, and go for it. So I think it's useful. We are developing our scale, of course. Um, it's related to more relevant, relevant constructs, as I said. Um, especially moral expansiveness, and it plays, I think, an interesting, uh, perhaps only small, role in moral creativity with the, that dissociation there, openness working with divergent and um, uh, compassion for convergent. I'll just put our fu my future directions up um, in case you want to ask about any of that, but my time, my time is up, so uh, thank you all. Um, so, as I understand it, what you're doing is it's a statistical composite of the existing openness and compassion measures. You've also got this goal of developing your own scale. That's right. I guess my question is, how, what sort of items are in your own scale? How do you how do you measure enlightened compassion directly? Yeah. So I, I can find that if I can read my computer, I can find the. Um, <laughs> uh, let me just. Um, sorry. Let me just go back. So they're really just items. I'll just find some example items for you. Um, but they're really items that get at the, the intersection. So the idea of um, showing concern for things that really aren't you know, close to you. So really being concerned with, you know, so there are questions about um, to what extent do you, are you concerned with sort of animal suffering? To what extent are you, do, do, do you value and are you concerned with protecting yeah, art sorry. and things like that? Yeah, does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, sure. so, yeah. So, yeah, so we have particular items that really target that intersection. Um, and when, when we look at the, our 24-item version, a lot of these effects are actually just stronger than what we get with the, with the BFAST versions, which is, which is really quite nice to see. Yeah. Um, thanks. This was great. Um, the, the dimension that, you, that you've identified reminds me a lot of a component of utilitarianism, which um, we've been referring to as impartial beneficence, or the idea that, that sort yeah. of each one comes for only one kind of thing. Um, have you looked at utilitarian thinking at all, um, and, and whether like is it, is enlightened compassion the same thing as the sort of positive core of utilitarian? It sounds like I, mean, I think I just we just saw your your, your paper just came out in this mm -hmm. round, like this year or something. So mm -hmm. it's a, yeah, so that, that's really that's really nice to see. So um, that that sounded almost exactly like what what we're what we're talking about. Um, we're still not quite sure what what the, what the process is because um, I'm I'm not sure what you what you think about this. Uh, impartial benevolence and whether you think it's grounded in sort of affective processes at all or not. And that's, that's an interesting question because openness, if you look, again, if you look at the items and some of the things it's associated with, it does have an affective component to it. Uh, it's associated with aesthetic sensitivity and things like this, which um, uh, potentially contribute to uh, uh, processes in ways that are not kind of strict kind of uh, rational impartiality. There might be affective dimension to the extension beyond that has something to the, to the extension of, of concern beyond the sort of uh, human animal boundary that has something less to do with sort of rational impartiality and more to do with, with just a, a, a broader sensitivity to things and a willingness to ap apply your moral concern to unconventional objects. So it's not quite clear to us precisely what, um, what's driving it. So it could be similar, or it could be slightly different depending on yeah. what's really driving the, the extension. And it's really interesting, I think, my sense is that there's there are probably sub populations where you can achieve a behavioral outcome of impartiality through a more kind of expansive my cup runneth over kind of emotional processes yeah. or a more um, sort of deliberative kind of um, almost kind of top down kind of you know, this is the right thing to do and 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 in our comp we've been we've been doing some work in our project with the effective altruist movement. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that there seem to be two subpopulations within the, the EA community. Um, and they, they seem to, uh, we don't have the data on this, we're looking at this, but just anecdotally from, from speaking with their leadership, um, there's this sort of 
the folks who are interested in things like existential risk and AI tend to be more of the like strategic impartial type, mm -hmm. and then the folks who are more interested in causes of animal welfare and global, global poverty seem to be higher on affect. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see. Maybe we should. Yeah, yeah, we should. Scale, yeah. yeah, but I think the other, the other interesting way to look at it in the context of the ethos might be just to look at how, how um, compassion combines with. with Openness mm -hmm. and how it combines with intellect, mm -hmm. which, are, which, are, which are two kind of yeah, yeah. two components of agreeableness, which, which which seem potentially to sort of tap that distinction. Mm -hmm. We haven't explored intellect uh, very much at all in, in, in our work, but that, that's a really interesting uh, possibility, mm -hmm. I think. Thanks. Um, okay, so thank you for your talk. I, I want to affirm a concern that you brought up um, part of the way through your presentation, um, which was <laughs> the fact that. Um, having a number of options open at any number of times is not always uh, a good thing. So um, oftentimes in um, character development, we'll talk about um, sort of the closing of options. Like you want to be formed in such a way that uh, certain certain options are no longer available to you. So you only see like the good choices instead of like all the possibilities for vice that you could tap into. Like, And I would say um, in most cases like, uh, moral creativity is not a quality that I would want in a friend because like I, I don't want to be surprised by like I don't know some sort of like cognitive promiscuity with respect to the number of moral choices that she could do at any given moment um, so I think it would be um, interesting like to have uh, moral creativity paired with maybe like vices um, to see like how um, because then you'd be directed like in a different direction like I think compassion carries you um, towards certain options that are amenable to living kind of a good life but it would be interesting to pair it with other things um, or just to look at um, uh, more like have like a longitudinal study with the same sorts of people to see if they having this sort of like openness and creativity consistently yields um, actions that um, are morally acceptable yeah, I, I think that's an interesting interesting idea. So yeah, I think that moral creativity per se is not necessarily good. Um, I think it might it might be, uh, our argument is that it's good in particular contexts where the only way out really is something that's not that's not obvious, right? And so given that, everything else equal, it's, it's, potentially, it's, it's potentially good there. But yeah, so it might, it might be interesting actually to, to sort of try to, because op yeah, openness alone, creativity alone, can go in either direction, right? And there's work that shows that. And our idea here was that, in like, it's, it's the compassion component that constrains that the application. That kind of seems to be borne out here, insofar as enlightened compassion via moral creativity leads to sort of better solutions, at least more, more acceptable to the stakeholders. If you combine openness with some less uh, um, positive trait, like the dark triad, you might actually get still contributions to moral creativity, right? But they might not be good or, you know, to, to good solutions anymore, right? So there's still creativity in the context of moral problem solving. Maybe you don't want to call that moral creativity, but creativity in the context of moral problem solving. Um, and that would be really interesting to us. Well, we haven't done it, but that's, um, that is a really nice idea. We might, we might play with that too. So I'm sorry to be tender. We're at noon, and I'm people trying to get to lunch. So let's thank our speaker. Cool, thank you. Thank you.